Hi, my name's Chris Clark. I'm president of the Australian Plant Society Victoria. I've got the honour today to introduce our three presenters for our exhibition, Australian Plants Revealed. This exhibition marks 250 years since Captain Cook's voyage uh, of discovery hit Australia's shores. Uh, in this voyage, Joseph Banks and Daniel Solander collected over 35,000 specimens for science. Our exhibition also covers uh, indigenous knowledge of Australian plants and the wonderful uses that our indigenous people put our plants to. I find the interaction between these two aspects, the science of botany and the indigenous use of Australian plants, fascinating and I hope you do too. Our first speaker today will be Auntie Irene Norman. Um, Auntie Irene is a proud Waywon Wiradjuri elder who will welcome us with a thought-provoking poem that she wrote specially for this event called A Plant Paradox. Our second speaker today is going to be Auntie Janet Turpy Johnston of Yulata and European heritage who will then enlighten us on Aboriginal societies and their great variety of uses for uh, Australian plant life. This will be followed by our keynote speaker Tim Entwistle. Tim is the CEO of the Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria and he will deliver his lecture Joseph Banks Cabinet uh, on Cook's voyage and on how Banks and Solander's observations were a very important milestone in the development of botanical science. I hope you find uh, it interesting. I found it very surprising some of his research. Thanks. A plant paradox. Science and practicality. Banks and Solander came from far away and it doesn't seem so long ago that they were looking around Botany Bay and found so many plants that they didn't know. Up the east coast they went, collecting plants all the way. The indigenous ones with uneasy portent wondered if these strangers would come back some day. Home to England, all this foliage was took. Drawn on plates, described so well. And yes, finally, put in a book. Not really much of a story to tell. For nowhere was written of what use all these plants were. Recorded minutely by a scriven. But how to utilise them? No mention stirred. The first peoples of this Australian land know the uses of these plants on display. And we are well met here, hand in hand to celebrate these discoveries of yesterday. For we, the indigenous ones, use these plants day by day for sustenance, medicine and play, always as a part of our life, from assuaging hunger to making a knife. We depend on the plants and trees to supply our lifestyle with all its needs. Weapons for hunting, to procure fish and meat, tools for weaving and digging yams so sweet, combs and brushes for our hair, flowers to eat, for dancing to wear, mud scrapers for when it rains, and medicants for when we are wounded or own pain. And it's okay for science to show its face, but the first peoples understand every plant's place. Banks and his mob deserve loads of fuss. But oh, you could learn so much from us. Now I'd like to introduce Auntie Janet Turpy Johnson. Wurmindjika, I'd like to acknowledge the lands on which are, well, we're all gathered to some degree, the multiple lands. I'd like to acknowledge the land on which I'm on at the present, which is Wurundjeri country and the nations of the Kulin, the Tagarong, the Jajarung, the Wathorong and the Boomerong and Bunurong. I'd like to acknowledge them all. I'd like to acknowledge the thousands of generations have lived on this country but most particularly in the context of this presentation, 
I'd like to acknowledge all the creatures and plants of this remarkable landscape. It's a landscape that's very easy to fall for. It has a remarkable emotional value. It's a, a, a landscape full of feeling. I'd like to acknowledge the colonial invasion and all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that stood tall and strong in defending their place in this land, defending this land as theirs. I'd like to acknowledge all the thousands of generations of those same people who sung and danced and made ceremony, told stories all about keeping country alive. I'd like to acknowledge all of that and, and particularly all of those through the colonial invasion that stood tall and strong in these lands, that defended their rights to these lands. And my generation again acknowledging all those that have done the same, standing tall and strong, standing up for this country and we are the sovereign people of this country and that is not just both history but past and future as well. I'd also like to acknowledge that in our dreaming, in our, in our struggle to be sovereign people, that the dreaming of our children, that they too can take it to another level and make sure that the Aboriginal voice is very much part of the way this country is governed and particularly in caring for our creatures and our plants. The evolution of, of Australian flora is about understanding country or more importantly knowing country about knowing you know the reason aboriginal stories tell a story so well is they keep that connection to the past that changes and changes in but keeps the connection keeps the connection to the law the law of this country the law of maintaining and sustaining the environment the ecological story of this country, keeping it standing up alive. I um, read country or I interpret country as all that is in, well, in the biosphere that sits around the earth, that thin blue line that can't be seen from, because we, we're immersed in it, but it still can't be seen from space. We only know it because we live in it. And the incredible intricate balances of the biosphere that, of course, respond and react to change not necessarily, as Darwin, I think, said about the strongest survive. I think it's about the most adaptable. And sometimes that's about weakness, not necessarily about strength. It's about understanding. So in country is all of that, flora, fauna, the vegetation, uh, the soils, because we now know how important the soils are, that everything that has lived and died on country is represented in those soils. But also country is about that anim animating force, that, that or life force, or I'm not sure what we, some pe people call it spirit, but that animating force that keeps everything alive. Because country is about feeling and aliveness is about feeling and feeling is about knowing, a beautiful Greek word, gnosis, that, that inner knowing. So understanding the evolution of Australian form, flora is where science and can help us in understanding the transformation of country through time and help us to understand some of the mechanisms of our other flora and fauna. But ultimately it's more about sustaining that bigger picture, that knowing country is about keeping everything standing up alive. Much of the flora that's around Australia comes from and there are still remarkable bits of our forest that still belong to that amazing period when Australia, when the Gondwana land broke up into its six or seven smaller continents. And that's the picture here. This was the simplified picture of the process. And of course, this took millions of years. And because Australia became an, an island continent, the flora and fauna technically only had its own landscape to e emerge and evolve in. Seeing the remnants of the Gondwana flora still, to some degree, part of this country harkens back to this remarkable history, this geological history, not just the human history, but this geological history, this mapping ourselves back into a, into a past that is transformative, it's full of energy, 
not just the landscape changing, the, the climate's changing, the water's changing, this, this, the balance is constantly in flux, like the ocean, which I showed at the beginning, that moving in and out, the constant moving, nothing's ever exactly the same. And I just wish to acknowledge botanists to watch that emerging of um, plants over this period of time that we can actually look back to the time of Gondwana land. And I just wish, you know, to not forget that we're very much part of a longer history. For Aboriginal people, it was understanding those interconnecting relationships, particularly between land, climate, water and plants, that constantly changing presence of the sun which stimulates everything else. And this is a seasonal map done uh, from Heron Island by Beth Gott, who is a, a botanist that I've had the pleasure of walking some of the forests with, uh, Telangi, the Telangi forests at a particular time when we're looking at fire stick burning. But to understand those finely tuned, tuned relationships, Aboriginal people didn't read the seasons like Europeans. They were not set down into four, four parts and the year wasn't divided into 365 point quarter days. The year flowed as the earth revolved around its axis, around the sun. The incredible nuances as the giant climate subtly changes with every single move. And of course, the sun stimulates what happens with water. And water, as we all know, is a major trigger for life. It's also a major trigger for um, removing the remnants of death or helping helping the dead decompose, not just dead animals but dead plants as well. Water is, is a, has remarkable properties. And, and the flow of water across landscape, which of course is driven by the movement of the sun, so understanding those interconnections, those relationships between the things of the bigger picture that to some degree sustain the, the biosphere from outside but help balance it from within. And then humans knowing their part within that, which is what the colonial invasion is teaching us, that we are an arrogant species who have decided to change all of these relationships for ourselves. Um, understanding country, understanding keeping everything standing up alive is about reading the landscape, reading what happens with plants, what happens with plants in response to the climate, the, the, the movement of the sun and the movements of water. Those are remarkable life-sustaining elements for us all. And, of course, we come to this remarkable sense of who people were and how they responded and how they reacted to, and this is, of course, pre-colonial times. This is in the time of what we call the ancestors. And humans have come very late to this story. We're still babies to some degree. We're still children playing in this. And, of course, I think the colonial invasion proves that, that we're still children playing on this remarkable planet, playing like toys. We still see it as our, as our game, that we're in control, that we can do all of this. Contemporary plants for Aboriginal ancestors is to know the interplace between, uh, as I've said, between the climate, the landscape and water. There are multiple landscapes across Australia and each of these landscapes has developed its own flora, its own connection to other parts and its own fauna. It, it, each of these has a unique profile. And here in Victoria, I think we have four or five different landscapes, coastal landscapes, mountain landscapes, temperate landscapes, desert landscapes, um, and the intermediary, the, those landscapes that sit between. And, of course, this points to the remarkable diversity of vegetation that is across, across all these landscapes, which then points to our times of our ancestors so providing a vast diversity of fresh food. And they took only what they needed from nature, although this diagram is by Hedge and it's down at uh, Dented Peninsula showing women collecting myrnongs. And they're digging Murnongs in, in a remarkably, in a sort of flat, cleared landscape. 
and Aboriginal people used fire to keep the landscape clean. Within the, the sort of eucalypt forest, when the temperate forest, fire kept the dead undergrowth burnt away and allowed the forest in, particu in, in particular for that clear area around the trees to keep providing sunlight. So sunlight trickling down through these trees helps stimulate the sort of smaller plants and the more native plants in regards to the provisions of different foods. But this image shows us women. Now, Major Mitchell also writes about coming across country from New South Wales to Victoria and coming across clusters of villages with women with large baskets out digging murnongs. And, and there's a wonderful Native American saying that says, why do I want to live in your cities and your the madness of your world where during the day I can live out learning about creation, learning about nature, learning about my country, telling each other the stories, learning about, about the wonders of nature and then sitting around the campfire eating food and then at night making love. It's a wonderful little image of of what Captain Cook and Joseph Banks were impressed with as they sailed up the east coast and looked out across the Aboriginal people, the, the occasional groups that they saw and how impressed they were with their simple and uncluttered lifestyles. Something I think we can all learn from. So there was this, there is a diversity of, of um, vegetation which provides a diversity of food. A lot of it was eaten fresh. For that that needed to be cooked was cooked in earth ovens and there's a great description of an earth oven with clumps of clay on the bottom that have been heated up, bark or um, grass overlaid and the food laid on top and more grass overlaid and then more heated clay balls on top and um, within an hour or so the food has been superbly roasted or steamed. But the great preparation shows sophistication. It shows that they've learned something from, from this. They've learned something about the interplay between heat and food. And there's also evidence around the um, meat because, you know, large or well, the large su supplies of protein and a lot of the vegetation in, in the Australian bush is high in protein. And also um, if there's lots of calorie value or or sugars or starch that they are also very slow digesting because this is a, the plants here are, are pretty tough. You know they 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 have an element about them. So I'd imagine there were great digestive systems. But even in the killing of a, a kangaroo, let's say the, the, the bigger creature, the cavity once it had been emptied out was filled with aromatic flavors, which talks about an evolved sense of taste a nuance, a sort of sensitivity, that this wasn't just rough and um, ready. It was something had been learned across time. I remember when I was up at the Jabakai in Queensland and a wonderful young man took us out into the bush and was talking about the big bunya nuts and that they're poisonous. But he said they learned that they could poke fine holes into them, into these great big nuts, and lay them in running water. And within a couple of days they could eat them quite safely. And there was an English tourist there who said something like, oh, how did they know how to do that? And this young man looked at her and winked and said, well, they had over 40,000 years to learn it. And I know sometimes when I've taught at university, I remind them that this is real peer-reviewed education, peer-reviewed research, you know, reflective action research, the action and then reflect upon it, learn from it. Think about what you've done. I'm not quite sure how many how many people it cost in, that, in the learning to be able to eat bunion nuts. So plants were eaten raw, berries off, um, breads, seeds were often ground down to make breads, wonderful examples of grinding stones around the country. And this, this lifestyle was, was quite sophisticated. This was not, I'm calling this more civilised because I'm seeing that these people had an innate respect, an innate feeling about the value of everything within nature. And despite the people often call this continent harsh, I actually call it quite vulnerable really, we're beginning to see it's only taken 100, 
85 years here in Victoria to break the nexus of that being a harsh continent and to destroy to some degree the whole um, pre-colonial um, outlook, the pre-colonial reality. But there seems to have been some deep understanding, deep sensitivities to how land and plants and Aboriginal people adapted to each other. We know the fire burning caused the barks on certain trees to change. We know that koalas learnt to skim to the top of the trees because the fires never raged that far. We now know from evidence of the latest bushfires how much damage we've done to the whole ecosystem, uh, particularly down here in the southeast, but how, how we've done that damage all up the eastern coast. So plants and people on this island continent in those pre-colonial days were, yeah, there were there were amazing climatic disruptions, ice age, people responding to floods, which of course bring with it great flocks of birds and amphibians and trees and insects. And, and, and we do know that Aboriginal people were very much engaged in, in savouring the different insects. But pre-colonial time was a depth of understanding, a depth of wisdom about what plants and how they operated within the environment and never, never to destroy anything. That you could take away the old, you could take away what was dying, but never ever take away its core life, its, its juvenile parts, those parts that continue to provide for the generations yet to come. So beautiful wisdom that comes from generations of the past is celebrated within the, the current generations and, of course, the heritage that's handed on. I just thought I'd show some Victorian banksia. This is coastal banksia or silver banksia, one of my favourite plants. It has a regal nature about it, a sense of presence, but it's also a thing that I've admired about Australian plants despite their colours and is there is a subtlety amongst the foliage. They're not an arrogant plant, a plant that seems to mischievously enjoy its presence within its branches and peers out of it sometimes. I have replaced my garden with lots of local natives and there is much, nothing nicer than to seeing the when the flowers come out and the bees and the insects turn up and then the birds turn up. Wonderful seeing that, that beautiful interplay of the flora and fauna together. Australian creatures, of course, have evolved with the plants. I think sitting at the top of the tree to some degree is the koala who eats only the eucalypt leaves. I know that Aboriginal people didn't eat koalas because I imagine it would taste like pure eucalypt to some degree. And it's interesting that we have a, a beautiful legacy in this country of Australian creatures. The um, lyrebird that I've imaged here, which was once so prevalent right throughout this landscape, is the oldest songbird in the world. This bird has sent the song out into the world. And Tim Lowe talks about this in his work around the story of birds, that it is the lyrebird who sang the stories first. And then it was the butcher bird, magpies and crows. And they have shared the song story out in the world, but they originated here in these forests. But also parrots that have such a prevalence in the Australian landscape have shared their intelligence with the world. The brightness of those birds, and I love it when um, my son's just put up a bird feeder in the yard and it fills with parrots and with sulphur-crested cockatoos. And I just love their mischievousness. They are so bright. It took the sulphur-crested cockatoo, one in particular, not long to figure out but if he cleared the seed away from the, the nozzle of the bottle, then the, the seed would just keep coming out. And it took him three minutes to empty a whole bottle of seed. But they have shared that intelligence with the world. That started here in this country. And I think we need to do a lot more understanding about the wisdoms of the flora and fauna of this country. I think we need to do a lot more bragging about the Joseph Banks paintings. Because the chances are, in the next generation, we could lose touch with all of this. As sad as I think that is, 
I don't think the colonial invasion is going to end. But I just wanted to finish with the Sacred Seed Project across the world. Vandana Shiva has been for 40 years now working on this project about preserving seeds because of the colonial invasions across multiple countries and the designation of limiting flora to only several crops. And, of course, they're about profit and they're about feeding humans. So, again, it's that commercial wheel that they're on. But Native Americans have taken up the Sacred Seed Project as well and keeping the seeds of the ancestors, of keeping all these alive. And I don't know whether you realise it, but when you hold a seed in your hand, you're holding 8 billion years of history. You know, the whole life of the planet is tied up in those tiny, tiny seeds. Like the birds represent the hordes of dinosaurs, those flocks of birds have sitting within them the millions of years of evolution of this country, as too do our seeds. And, and it's something that makes me very sad that when we start to dictionise what I call dictionise the language or turn everything into museums and zoos, we lose intimate contact with the reality of what this planet is all about. We lose contact with the biosphere and it becomes anthropomorphic. It becomes just about humans, which is what our cities are, concrete and asphalt. So this Sacred Seed Project is a very important ongoing process of preserving native seeds in their native state of keeping that story alive and it go back to my first slide were Minjika where I acknowledged if we think we're smart enough if we think that this is about what we know let me tell you it's time that we learned to be a lot more sensitive about what our plants what our animals and what our planet knows about letting them tell us their story so that it stops being just about what we know, um, what we have learned and how we, we use it. And Sacred Seeds is very much about the tradition and look it up, research it, of keeping everything standing up alive in country. And I think it's why we need the work of Banks and his artists and lithographers and sketchers and because, like, there are photographs in the um, in Bunjalaka of Aboriginal people dressed up in crinolines, look at them and it's painful, but they're the only records we have of those ancestral times. And it's the same with the artwork of Joseph Banks and with something like our Sacred Seed Project it's often all we have of that pre-colonial world. Because one thing I'm learning and one thing my research is throwing up is that invasion is ongoing. And as much as that breaks my heart, I'm not quite sure what else I can say. The transformations that the colonial invasion have brought have been almost absolute. I can't beg people enough to be more aware of our native world, to be more aware of the incredible gift of it, its uniqueness within the whole of the planet, to preserve it. Let more forests grow. Let more plants grow. Let's have more birds, frogs, insects back. Let's be annoyed by life itself. Waminjika. Thank you. And now for our keynote speaker today, Professor Tim Entwistle. I'm going to talk today about what I've called the botanical bounty of the Endeavours voyage to New Zealand and Australia. And I've given it the title, The Voyage Around the World. And here you can see it tracked out with the various times and places visited. They're actually in German on this picture. But the impact of that ship, the, the Bark Endeavour, and a bark is a, a sailing vessel which has three or more masts and a particular style of rigging, the Endeavour's voyage to the Pacific uh, was profound, of course. For modern day Australians particularly, the consequences of Joseph Banks landing at Botany Bay remain in a sense unfinished business with reconciliation between the first inhabitants and modern Australia still unresolved. The legacy for, for World Botany, though, uh, is, was to reveal to the rest of the world 
a flora where 80% of the plants or the plant species grew nowhere else, but it had been understood and used by the people living in that land for some 60,000 years. So a very momentous occasion in terms of botany, which is primarily what I'm going to talk about today. And if we look at that voyage, I just want to first of all run through the, the key dates. We'll come back to a lot of this later, but uh, starting in August in 1768, they leave uh, Plymouth. They then get to Tahiti in April and they spend a couple of months there. And they're of course there to see the transit of Venus, which I'll also just make brief mention of a little later, but uh, rest assured this is primarily all about botany. We go from Tahiti, or they went from Tahiti through to New Zealand, where they spend nearly six months in New Zealand. They get to Australia uh, between April and August, but a lot of that time, in fact, about you know a few months of it, are spent fixing their ship up after it runs aground in Queensland. And it's only a few weeks spent at uh, Botany Bay. But Botany Bay is the place that is probably most closely associated with the trip and the one I will talk about a bit today. And from there in Australia, they sail back and they get to England on the 12th of July, 1771. So it's uh, a significant, momentous trip and it did really change the face of botany. But that, um, that boat, of course, and we, we all learn about this is such a small boat, a tiny boat with uh, uh, people used to having a lot more space uh, on board. So we had uh, people who like banks who were fairly rich in their life and were, had high expectations of what they'd have on that ship. So they did try and set themselves up even in this tiny little space uh, so that they could do their botany, so that they could study the world when they were in Australia. This is actually where the ship was being repaired. So this is in Queensland. Uh, where they spent quite a little bit of time. Now, the instructions that uh, Lieutenant James Cook got in 1768, some of these you know, are fairly well known. He, he traveled to Tahiti for what was described as astronomical observations uh, of the transit of Venus across the sun. And when you match that with others around the world, the whole idea or the thought here was that they could calculate more accurately the distance of Earth from the sun and other uh, things in space. So it was really something that they were quite keen. It was as part of this exploring, understanding the world around them. And it's interesting, isn't it? They would spend so much time and money and effort to make that measurement so that they could get that calculation. And there's a, a lovely link back to Melbourne here too. The Melbourne Observatory, which is part of uh, Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria, uh, was involved in the next transits of Venus. And look, these, um, these transits or these events occur uh, every, it's about 100 years. So it's, they've got this little odd cycle. And again, I'm a botanist, not an astronomer, but it's, it's 120 and then 100 years, and they come across in pairs. So the observatory was very, uh, very involved in two transits in 1874 and 1882. And in fact, they, the Victorian Parliament um, purchased a, an equatorial telescope and another one called a photoheliograph, which takes pictures of the sun, hence the, the photoheliograph. Um, and th that, that observatory really um, played a really important part in that next observation of the transits of Venus. So it, it's nice just to put this in context that that, that trip um, that Cook did was the first time they were doing that. And then we repeat that. And it's happened more recently, of course, in just the, the last few years as well. In 2004 was the last transit. He then had secret instructions to sail southwards to establish the existence of a, of a large continent, which they had predicted previously, and to survey for rocks, plants and animals. That was the instructions he had. But also, the, the words were, you are also with the consent of the natives to take possession of convenient situations in the country in the name of the King of Great Britain, or if you find the country uninhabited, take possession for his majesty by setting up proper marks and inscriptions as first discoverers and possessors. So that's what he was told. Now, Cook explicitly had uh, orders to not seize land from inhabitants. He was told not to do that, um, but he did claim the land for England. And of course, by the 1780s, Arthur Philip and others were seizing land throughout Australia. But let me return to botany and to the value and imperative, if you like, for collecting on this trip. 
So the reasons they were they were doing that it was curiosity really that that led it. it was about the land and their contents and particularly they did want to confirm and map that that southern continent so that's really what drove them down there there were of course commercial and strategic advantages they wanted to look for things that would help England and uh, commercially help England and that could be plants and animals or it could be strategic uh, uh, points around the world as well there was prestige in gaining new knowledge in the age of enlightenment so really if you are uh, it's an interesting thing to think about today it was really something that was valued highly is to find out new things to tell people about that to bring back news of things people hadn't seen before or perhaps a greater understanding of the world in which they live so it's a very it's also almost a novel concept these days in some ways um, there was a, prom a promotion testing and I've said pursuit of the Linnean uh, system of naming and classification so it's not long after uh, the, the, the whole Carl Linnaeus set up that system of naming plants which all of you are familiar with a genus and a species I've given you a lovely example here Entwistlia bella uh, in the Entwistliaceae, the Entwistliales, and it's a, a red alga for those who you might be shocked that you don't know of it, but it's a, an alga and a seaweed that grows near Tasmania. But that's by the by. That's the system we use for naming plants, and they did want to test that. So, uh, you know, I suppose in the back of their mind, they were thinking, would, would they find the same kind of plants? Would they find ones that would sit inside that system within the families, within the genera? Uh, and interestingly, they, of course, they found a lot that, that didn't quite fit. And with him on that trip was a companion and that companion on with Cook was the 25 year old Joseph Banks who was there to gather natural specimens and prepare scientific notes now just think about it this is a, a 25 year old um, man from England out on a ship uh, he he was moneyed so he was able to employ an assistant and that assistant was a Swedish naturalist uh, Daniel Salander and three artists of course so the way they recorded what they saw was to draw and paint uh, because of course you know they take things back to England even if they dried the specimens they're not going to look like they looked out in the field uh, let me just run through the key players that we're going to talk about um, so D D Salander was a student of Carl Linnaeus so I mentioned him he, he'd set up that that naming system that we now follow in 1753 they started to name plants with a genus and a species name and he was a, a student of Linnaeus's in Sweden, but he lived mostly in London. He's a, a botanist, librarian to banks, and the trip to Australia was totally funded and financed by banks. Sidney Parkinson's probably the best known artist on board. He prepared drawings and watercolours. His trip financed by banks. Uh, sketches are held in the Natural History Museum. Uh, they were coloured and completed, but they weren't really published. And I'll come back to this as well. Uh, until 1990 in the Banks Florilegium and then of course the, the star of my talk today Joseph Banks um, 1743 to 1820 he had inherited wealth and estate so he, he had money he could employ people to come with him he was an amateur botanist at the age of 18 and in fact he, when he found there was no botanist at Christchurch Oxford where he went to study he traveled to Cambridge and brought back uh, Israel Leon who Leon's who uh, was an astronomer and botanist to lecture them so he's able to sort of manipulate a little bit to try and get a botanist to Oxford but uh, he didn't actually graduate so he wasn't really a trained botanist but but very keen as an amateur botanist uh, his first voyage out of the out of England was to Newfoundland and then Australia and he also went to Iceland later on so he did a bit of traveling around the world he was elected to the Royal Society at the age of 23 the youngest president at the age of 35 and he held that position to his death at 77 now this is a very prestigious organization uh, the Royal Society of London and he was a member at the age of 23 so again a very young man when he got involved in science and involved in that society and he eventually became an honorary director of Kew Gardens so he never worked at Kew Gardens but he did help support Kew and uh, help them in planning the development of that particular garden He's a portrait of Banks in 1814 um, by Thomas Phillips and he's about 70 years old there so he's wearing the uh, uniform a military uniform and he has the red ribbon of the order above so uh, uh, this is later in life of course after he'd been to Australia and Australia really did set him up that trip there uh, which was 
a courageous thing to do at that age, but something that uh, was done quite often by people with money. You know, they, they were willing to take that risk and it really did set them up uh, for life in terms of the stories they could tell, the adventures and how they were seen when they returned. Now, I give you a picture here, not of banks. This is of the young Tim Entwistle at the age of 25. And I do that because what, what I think is significant in this story is to think about what it was like as a 25 year old coming to Australia. And we have to see what he wrote and his observations through those eyes. So it's not a, a mature person, a mature man who'd, who'd you know, been all over the place through his life and was then coming to Australia with that, all that wisdom. It was a young man probably with very little of an idea of what he was about to experience. And so we'll look at how much was known in Europe. What would he have known about Australia and New Zealand, even as a 25-year-old? Well, look, he'd be aware to some degree they would that, that people had been to the to lands at the north of Australia. So they're looking for the great southern continent, which is down south, more an Antarctic, uh, Antarctica kind of discovery thereafter. But there had been, of course, many trips that had gone to the northern parts of Australia. And 1606, uh, a Dutch navigator landed on the western side of Cape York Peninsula and met uh, local Aboriginal people at that encounter. So there was a connection made with the country. Later in that same year, there was a Spanish sailor who went through the Strait Torres. So his name was uh, Louis Vaz de, de Torres and Torres was his strait. And he was under a Portuguese captain. Um, interestingly, that Portuguese captain, uh, uh, Quiros, I think you might pronounce his name, he writes to the King of Spain, who was funding the trip and funded many trips at that time uh, of traveling around the world. And he said he was taking possession of all that he saw and he called it Australia or Australia de El Spirito Santo, the southern land of the Holy Spirit. And this was all named in honor of the Queen Margaret of Austria. And you, you can kind of see a bit of a, a, a connection there. This, now Australia was not named Australia at that time and there's been a little bit of a debate raging over the years about what he was referring to and then some people say look he really only meant Vanuatu, others say he meant all the land we are seeing, that is everything they went through, what was in front of them, what was behind them and they went through Torres Strait remember. So you could argue if you wanted to that uh, that name or something like our current name came about a little, a little bit earlier than uh, we know it which is um, more formally quite a little bit later. So between 1606 and 1770, and this is interesting, and I, I don't think I quite realised this till I was doing research for this talk, 52 European ships from various European nations made contact with Australia. So these were coming to the north of Australia, making contact, perhaps trading, um, but quite a lot of contact with what we now call Australia. 41 of these were from the Netherlands, and that includes Abel Tasman uh, in 1600, 1642 and 1644. Uh, and, and also the first European contact with New Zealand at that time. So there's a bit of activity at the north end of Australia. So you've got a young guy coming to Australia. Uh, people knew a little bit about what was going on at the north end. They didn't quite know how the country was shaped or <laughs> how it related to the rest of the, the continents in that area. The other lovely comparison I think is if we think back 50 years to the landing on the moon, uh, it's, it's a little bit like this, you know, when, when uh, the first uh, people got to the first humans stepped on the moon, they knew a little bit about the planet. They, in that case, they'd seen um, images, some photographs. Uh, that wouldn't have been the case with Australia. But there'd been a little bit of information, but not much. So you do have to conceive of this and think of Banks as the, uh, the young 25-year-old on his way to something like the moon. It's a big trip, uh, a big voyage. And I don't really think he could have known what he was going to encounter there. So he did keep a diary. So we, we, we know what he encountered, or at least we can see what he, or hear about what he found. And again, with his diary, you, you have to think about this. This is not someone in their, uh, their 50s, 60s or 70s looking back and reflecting on the, their time there. This is a 25 year old. And I showed a picture of what I was like when I was 25, that kind of person writing in their diary about what they saw. So you, you do have to sort of read in that context and, and he's writing in a style of the time. So this is a lovely little phrase here. Now I do wish that our friends in England could by the assistance of some magical spying glass, 
take a peep at our situation. Dr. Slander sits at the cabin table describing him, uh, myself at the bureau journalising. Between us hangs a, a large bunch of seaweed. Upon the table um, lays the wood and barnacle. They would see that notwithstanding our different occupations, our lips move very often and without being conjurers, might guess that we were talking about what we should see upon the land, which there is no doubt we shall see very soon. So this is on board the ship as they're getting towards uh, New Zealand, actually. So getting very excited about what they might see, looking at some of the samples they'd already collected. And of course, you know, if you're out at sea, you collect seaweeds because that's, that's what you can find and you're going to study something while you're there. But, uh, you know, it's an adventure. It's a 25-year-old on an adventure. So they, they went to New Zealand first, as I mentioned already. Uh, in October 1769, uh, New Zealand is sighted. Banks thinks it may be part of the Great Southern Continent. Cook doesn't, quite correctly, he doesn't think it is. Uh, in January 1770, Cook climbs up a peak on uh, Arapaua Island and he confirms the presence of what uh, he called Cook Strait and therefore the separation of those two main islands of New Zealand. And combined with later observations, oh sorry, the earlier observations of Tasman in 1642, these islands are not the large continent that they sought. So Banks was not correct there. Um, March 1770, they go further south. They see the strait between Stewart Island and the South Island. Um, but interestingly, they don't display that on their maps. And that's thought to be for strategic reasons, whatever they are or whatever they thought. And they don't actually illustrate that on their maps. But they did see that strait. So they, they spent quite a deal of time in New Zealand collecting material, collecting plants, and also, of course, uh, finding the inhabitants of New Zealand. And so this is the first contact with uh, Maori. And from Banks' diary of October 1769, he says, thus ended the most disagreeable day my life has yet seen. Black be the mark for it and heaven sent that such may never return to embitter future reflection. And so this is after four New Zealanders uh, are killed on that first encounter. So it was a very bloody introduction to that country. What's if you I've just taken a quote here a little bit later from the Encyclopedia of New Zealand. So looking back, uh, it's interesting the, the way it is cited or summarized is after this, Cook and his men had friendly contact with Maori. Um, so there was a, a bloodshed on that first day, not so much later on, but certainly that first encounter as it was in Australia, it very, very aggressive. Um, they then spent, as I said, a lot of time in New Zealand uh, observing the indigenous flora of the country. And you get comments in the diary which are interesting about both countries' floras. Uh, and I'll come back a little bit to the observations on Australia, but this is just one from the diary where he's, uh, Banks estimates there's, fifth from the, apart from 15 or so species, there's 400 that they've collected have not been described by any botanists. So he, he saw abundant verdure of grass and trees, lots of novelty. So he was quite excited by the variety and the things that they'd never seen before. He said the finest timber his eyes had ever beheld. Now, he'd only come from England, so that maybe that's not much, but he was quite excited by that. He notes a few times that fern roots are, are eaten and treated. So there's a little bit of what we call these days ethnobotany or how, how plants are used and eaten for medicine and food and for clothing. And he talks about the fern roots being treated and eaten for starch, yam, sweet potatoes being grown. Uh, although he does say in one place, uh, such places of, as we have not yet seen the least appearance of cultivation. I suppose they live entirely upon fish. I think he means to put a comma in there. Fish, dogs and enemies. So uh, there's a, a sort of a backhanded um, remark here about cannibalism, I suspect. But he's essentially saying he, you know, he, he doesn't understand really how the how the people are assisting on this kind of land, what they're really eating, and if he doesn't see cultivation in the sense that he recognises cultivation, which of course is interesting today in Australia, uh, he wouldn't, you know, if he didn't see the, the great huge fields with rows and neatly tilled and all that kind of thing, he may not have recognised cultivation either. Uh, and another quote here, uh, Dr. Slander and myself, who have now nearly exhausted all the plants in our neighbourhood, they were at Queen Charlotte Sound, went today in search for mosses and small things. And they had great success uh, gathering very remarkable ones. So if they run out of the 
the flowering plants or vascular plants, they'll turn to anything uh, to collect. It's, it's a bit of a bug. Um, you know, there's an enthusiasm for novelty and new things, but I, I think also you've just got to get as much as you possibly can. And you've got to make sure you go back with the, the most, the best and the most exciting uh, natural history specimens you possibly can. So that's New Zealand, um, it just, just, you know, in a nutshell, really. But when they leave for New Zealand, they set off for Australia, March 1770. Uh, Cook notes in his diary that he's set aside most, if not all, the arguments to prove that there must be a, a southern continent. So he, there is not a southern continent as they were expecting, or not expecting, as they were testing. So this is not this big, large land. He, he doesn't go further south, of course, to discover Antarctica or find Antarctica. Um, he admits he doesn't know what lies southward, but his ship is not prepared for such a journey. He can't go further south. So he decides to return home past uh, Van Diemen's Land and the east coast of New Holland. So the first observations of uh, the New South Wales part of New Holland, they see a large float of seaweed. It's always about seaweeds, a small butterfly and a small land bird. So they know they're getting near land in April 1770. Then they see slopey, they see, a, see the continent of Australia. Sloping hills covered in parts with trees and shrubs, and this is his spelling, but interspersed with large tracts of sand. So it's the first sighting of the land, but what's interesting is you get this same repeated sort of observation all the way up, up the, uh, the coast. And then he sees smokes and fires, or they, they both see smokes and fires, and it's recorded in Banks diary. Large fires were lighted this morning about 10 o'clock, we suppose that the gentleman ashore had a plentiful breakfast to prepare, which I, I love. Is, is this sort of image, he, I think, of them uh, getting up at a leisurely hour and probably getting the, the cooks to put on breakfast out the back and it would be ready by 10 o'clock when they, uh, they wanted to have their breakfast. So that again, uh, a 25-year-old Englishman uh, sitting on a ship looking at a country uh, with people who have lived there 60,000 years with a flora he'd never seen before, trying to take that in and interpret that through his own eyes. Now the encounter in Australia has been much repeated and I'm just, I've got here on, on the slide some words used by Professor Steve Hopper who is uh, head of Kings Park and also director of Kew for a number of years and he described this in his um, 2012 Menzies lecture. The cook first, his, the boat was greeted on the beach at Botany Bay or Kama by a teenager and an adult with spears raised and as Steve Hopper puts, us, puts it, uh, telling the visitors essentially to bugger off. And the ship and its crew were interpreted, at least by some of the, the people in the area, as a large white bird filled with possums scampering up and down. So you've got exactly the same thing going on from the other side of the, uh, the water, if you like. Uh, you've got uh, the Aboriginal people trying to interpret and work out what the ship is. The same way that the person on the ship's trying to work out what's going on on land, they're trying to work out what the ship is. Uh, Australians were more used to visitors at first messaging with fires or sending scouts with message sticks. So this was the people arriving were not the kind of people they had seen before. And Cook, after his rather hostile reception in New Zealand, he does respond from a boat with Banks and Slander and he has a Tahitian, a Tupaya with him, and he orders a volley above their heads at first and then one into the legs of the older man and then another round, be, round before the older one r ran away. So the older uh, man runs off the beach, but he gets his shield and he returns. And the two Australians uh, hurl spears at the boat. Uh, no one's hit by the spears and they get two more volleys back at them from the, from the boat and they throw another spear and then they leave the Englishman to disembark. So that, that's the first encounter of these two uh, cultures who've not experienced each other before. And, <laughs> It feels like a kind of an awful wasted opportunity. I think I'm mean, putting through the lens of today, you think two cultures meeting for the first time and that's the way that interaction occurs. But um, you know, as I say, we, we're looking back on this from our, our vantage point here today. So there were observations on Indigenous peoples in the diaries, both of Cook and of Banks. And um, this, I saw this summed up in a document around, um, written about Banks, and he, his view was in Tahiti, they were greeted cautiously. Uh, in New Zealand, they were treated belligerently. This is, this is Banks' interpretation. And in Australia, he said with aloofness. He thought they were treated with aloofness. Um, for Banks, he, he perceived a kind of apathy. He wrote, he described it as apathy in Australians. 
and he was he, he he said this was worse than the violence of the Maori or the thieving of the Tahitian. So he, his stereotyping of of cultures is um, again it's you know a, a young person not particularly well versed in how to deal with these things. And according to a, a book called The Endeavour, Peter Moore wrote, um, yeah, he, he he just he didn't quite understand the the approach of the Australians, and he seemed when Peter Moore looked into this a bit, he seemed particularly vexed by the attitude as he saw it that they were next to this wonderful thriving plant life, yet they weren't doing anything about it. Now, of, again, you look back and you say, of course, <laughs> they were living in this landscape, they understood the plants, and we've already heard about that, how much they knew about the plants. Um, but for him, they weren't pressing them, they weren't putting them in herbarium, they weren't um, perhaps writing scientific papers. His interpretation of what you do with a thriving plant life is you squash it between some bits of paper and you put it in a building called a herbarium, which is the kind of place I work in today. So I, I understand that side of the business, but he had one view of what he expected for them to do. Um, there are also, of course, observations on the indigenous flora of Botany Bay. What's interesting here is that they're, they're largely useless. His, his comments about the flora, are just, you, again, you feel such a wasted opportunity. The, the sort of descriptions you get, this is from Cook, woods, lawns and marshes. That's the description of what he saw. You know, that, that, where, that could be anywhere. Does that describe uh, the east coast of uh, Australia for you? Uh, vast quantities of grass, says Joseph. That's lovely, lovely description of the country. Uh, wood is here in great plenty, yet there's very little variety. Now, this is Cook. Cook's actually, uh, I, I must say, is a little bit better than Banks when he comes to describing things. Wood is here in great plenty, little variety. Largest trees are larger than our oaks in England. They probably look at eucalypts. There's another sort that grows tall and straight like pines, and these are possibly casuarinas. Lots of shrubs and, and palm trees, and I think he's seeing Liverstone of the palm and cycads there and mangroves about the head of the harbour. So at least we get a, a little bit of a sense from Cook of what's going on. Um, and a, a, in a paper that uh, Doug Benson and Eldershaw did in 2007 about Botany Bay, they just made the comment that Banks would have disagreed about the underestimate of shrubs. So Banks, Banks would have known and would have noticed there were more shrubs there. Cook might not have, but Banks did not write about it, sadly. So botanising in Australia, um, some more observations up, up the coast. Um, plants that we had not seen before among them were uh, still more East India plants than the last harbour. So he's comparing them with things that he's seen before and, and starting that sort of biogeographic study that I guess continues today is looking how, where does, what's the flora of Australia like? Uh, is it, are there plants that only grow here? We know about 80% only grow here. What are the connections with other places in the world? And then eventually, of course, we we, we made the connection with Gondwana and that, that, that history which Banks was not aware of. He says there are innumerable fruits, many plants I had not seen in this country before. Well, that's that's good. And Solander and myself employed ourselves winding up our botanical bottoms. Now, I don't know what a botanical bottom is, so I just, I just it's a lovely phrase and I'm sure it has deep meaning, but examining what we wanted and making up our complement of specimens as many species as possible. Essentially, he's making herbarium specimens and wrapping them up into, into bundles, and that's what he's um, spending his time doing. And then on in July 1770, botanizing with no kind of success, the plants were now entirely completed and nothing new to be found, which would amuse any botanist working in Australia today that he felt he'd, he'd done the job and, uh, and time, time to leave. Uh, they did make some observations on the indigenous fauna, the animals, and uh, this is uh, in July 1770. Our second lieutenant, John Gore, who was uh, shooting today, had the good fortune to kill the animal that has so long been the subject of our speculations. Its forearms are extremely short and uh, no use to it walking. Its hind, again, is disproportionately long. With these, it hops seven or eight feet. So you're probably guessing they've encountered their the first marsupial, uh, and the beast which was killed yesterday was today dressed for our dinners and proved excellent meat. So they've eaten their first kangaroo, and um, they he was interested in it, of course. It was an odd animal, and uh, they did enjoy eating it for dinner. I've just popped in a little aside here. I have uh, an interest, personal interest in Dr. Johnson, Samuel Johnson. I find him a fascinating person of that that era. And uh, this is him imitating a kangaroo. So the stories that went back about the kangaroos excited people, you know, he, and 
Banks would have told stories about them and how they shot it and how they ate it, what it did and its hopping and how odd it was. And Dr. Johnson apparently was quite excited by this animal and uh, it did some, uh, d d displayed, I guess, uh, how, how it would look and how it would uh, dance about. And I'll just make a, a stop there for a second. So let me turn back though to the botanical bounty of the endeavor because this talk is really about the plants and they brought back 30,000 plant specimens. So these are oppressed herbarium plant specimens squashed uh, on bits of paper uh, and they made their way back across the seas, 30,000 of those, including many replicates. So they would get lots and lots, you know, they could tens, 20, 30 sometimes of the same specimen so they had duplicates and replicates to send to other places. And they were pressed mostly in, in book proofs, um, including Milton's Paradise Lost, apparently. There, were, it's interesting to make a comparison with other trips around the time. And you'll see, I've just put a little footnote here, the, the Malaspina expedition to South America, which did actually pass through Port Jackson in 1793. Uh, that five year trip came back with 15,000 specimens. So about half as many specimens but it did have, that particular one had 7,000 species. They brought back, or Banks brought back, 3,600 specimens. So slightly less rich in terms of variety, but more material. So he's obviously very keen to get a lot of material, lots of backups. And these came from Tahiti, from New Zealand, from Australia, uh, as we of course know. Uh, also lots of illustrations, and I mentioned Sidney Parkinson, uh, he sketched them. Uh, 743 were published eventually in copper plate en engravings and in the Banks Florilegium, uh, and that was done between 1980 and 1990. So they did sit around not being published for a very, very long time. There were plants from lots of new places. So as they traveled around, um, they would collect. So every place they stopped, they would collect. And so the material, and I'll just give you a few examples here, was, was, did cover the entire trip. And you get things even from Madeira, just as they start. And this is um, Hebedenia excelsa, a small tree. You can just see a tiny little specimen up there on the right there. Uh, and, and, the, and so these are new plants that have not been found before. They get to Terra del Fuego in South America. Uh, they get a Nothophagus there, a Betuloides. And they bring, put that in the collection. They bring that back, of course, to England as well. The Society Islands, they get breadfruit, they bring that back, that had been found before, but they, so they're recollecting some material they know and some that is unknown and to be described. Our Formium tenax, the flax from New Zealand, that was seen as a, a possible economic plant to bring back to England. And let me just show you a, a couple of herbarium specimens. So this is what they look like. This is the material collected by banks. I find this, no matter how often I, I see this in picture, I see this in reality, and you, you, this is the specimen that was snapped off or cut off and put on, it wouldn't have been as neatly put on a bit of paper then, I don't think, but would have been pressed and taken back to England. And these are the specimens that Banks brought back with him and Salander. So the forming 10 acts from New Zealand. And as an example of the Australian flora, Banksia serrata um, from Botany Bay. Uh, an amazing specimen, you know, a Banks here, which is eventually named after Joseph Banks from Botany Bay in Australia, collected in April 1770. This is what that looks like. Uh, these are two that I've, I've got here from uh, the National Herbarium Victoria, National Herbarium of New South Wales. Uh, we have, you know, you can see here, they, they look a little bit different. These are from, I don't know if he collected, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have collected from the same actual specimen, which is what we do today. But these would have been collected from specimens around Botany Bay and then taken uh, back to London and then eventually distributed back to Australia. There were multiple copies, as I said, and that's an important part of their collecting. And they all made their way back to England and they all got put in the herbaria there. Uh, between 1900 and 1930s, they distributed replicates of these uh, specimens around the world. And that was really as a bit of an insurance policy, perhaps a little bit of repatriation to get the specimens back to the places where they came from, um, but to make sure that they didn't lose any of those. And it turned out to actually be the right thing to do. In September 1940, the Natural History Museum of London was bombed during World War II and some of the specimens were damaged, including the banks and salander material. So they could have all been destroyed. So these days, as, as then, 
we always collect more than one specimen and we send material to other herbaria around the world as a kind of insurance policy. And I just pop in this picture at the bottom here in Rio de Janeiro in September 2018, a huge fire, but all the collections in the major museum there. Thankfully, in terms of botany, the herbarium was elsewhere. The specimens were not in that museum. They'd been moved to another building uh, at another time or a few years earlier, um, but the, all the, the material was lost in that collection. So really important that we have these replicates of material, really important we have all our herbaria active and working, and that we do start these days to digitize, to, get, to have another sort of backup for those specimens. But I do digress. Let's go back to the, uh, the specimens themselves. And this is where they end up. And look, there's a lot of detail here. I don't really want to go through each one, but it just gives you a bit of a sense of those um, specimens sent around the world. You can see there's a lot of them in the Natural History Museum of London. So over 800 uh, there. These numbers are very, very wobbly um, <laughs> because they're, they're just based on uh, sometimes only based on type material because the, the the we've only really checked through the collection for what we call a types and types are those specimens where if you name a plant you give it a name and in Whistler Bella I spoke about before there'll be a, a seaweed sitting on a piece of paper that carries that name forever and it's always the reference point and they're called types very very important specimens all the other material collected of that species and that turns out to be quite a rare one so there's not much more um, would be important material for understanding that species but it's not the reference point so these types are important we know more about them than other things so a lot of this data is based on types and there are sure to be many more specimens but you can see New South Wales has, has a lot has 800 uh, in New Zealand you can see Te Papa there 500 Auckland 500 uh, in Victoria we, we know we have more than 390 uh, sorry 359 there's probably more to be found because we have a large global collection uh, so sort of about 350,000 still, which we haven't uh, databased or uh, unwrapped, if you like. And these were brought into the herbarium by Ferdinand von Mueller. And inside those, there could be more material from the Bank Salander collections, particularly uh, from outside Australia. And so we, we expect we'll find more material in those collections as we go through them, uh, database them, get, the, get them properly mounted into the collection. Uh, and then you can see other figures there. And a lot of Australian herbaria have them down the bottom. But as I said, be careful because those numbers are probably much, much higher. So what else did he bring back to London uh, besides lots of plant material and stories about eating kangaroos? Well, he brought back news of surfing. Yeah, in his diary, he says, uh, this is in Tahiti. The chief amusement was carried out by the stern of an old canoe. With this before them, they swam out as far as the outermost uh, breach. <laughs> I think it was beach, or it could be breach. Then one or two of them would get into it and opposed and opposing the blunt end to the breaking wave were hurried in with incredible swiftness. So that's his description of surfing. The first uh, time surfing had been brought back, we think, to the UK or to England. Um, and the other one I'll put there is a, a little bit uh, stretching of perhaps, but he brought back news of tattoos, but he also, look, potentially, and this could be fake news, he, he could have brought back a tat himself. But um, this morn I saw the operation of tattooing the buttocks performed on a girl of about 12 years, and it proved, as I've always suspected, a most painful one. So I think that would have put him off tattooing. But despite that, there have been suggestions made at various times he may have acquired a tattoo on his trip and brought it back to, the, to England. I, I suspect not because when you read his diary and, and you read about his life, he would have told everyone he had a tattoo. He would not have hidden it, no matter what the social standing of a tattoo would have been at the time, he could not have uh, but boasted about it. So I suspect he didn't have one. Um, what they did next, so they, they, they talked about the trip, I've talked about the plant material they collected, talked about that material being distributed around the world. So that, that was a, a legacy of that. But if we look at each of those key players on the trip, Parkinson very sadly died of dysentery on the, on the return trip between Java and Cape Town, and so didn't make it back to England. Uh, Salander kept botanizing in, in Europe. Uh, he was appointed keeper of natural history at, uh, of natural history at the British Museum, and he lived with Banks, and he died in May 1782. So what did Banks do next? Well, one thing Banks didn't do, 
was publish his botanical discoveries from Australia or New Zealand. And I, I do want to just dwell on that briefly here. And um, I've got a little description here taken from, and I do thank David Mabley, who summarised this in a, a paper in 2011. Um, but Banks is the author, now author, you know, the describer, the person who described a, a name of three botanical names. So I told you all the material he found and, just, and, and took back to the UK. England, from Australia and other countries. He's got his name against three species uh, and through publication of, of engravings. Now these are coupled with Solander and his name is also appended to a few other names as well in the uh, Natural History of Aleppo, but everyone presumes that to be Solander's work. And in fact, even where he's the author of those names, we don't believe he actually was involved in publishing those. Now there are other botanical names attributed in era or published formally by others from Banks' manuscript names. Uh, now that, what that means is he would have scribbled something on a piece of paper in a herbarium and then somebody when they came to describe the plant said, okay, he's recognised this as new, let's use his name when we describe it. And there's a, a very formal protocol for how you deal with that uh, in botanical nomenclature. But even then, it's, uh, most people think it wasn't Banks that would have scribbled any names anyway. It would have been Solander or others like Dryandra who were going through the collections. So they did collect, you know, 1,400 specimens new to science from the Endeavour ex uh, expedition. Solander did prepare descriptions of some on the voyage and he revised some in London. Banks prepared some illustrations to go with them uh, from Parkinson's drawings but none of those were published. So none of the material from the Endeavour was published. The names he's associated with are not from Australia, and even then we're not quite sure that he had much to do with them at all anyway. So he would not hold down a job in a modern university. That's the first thing to note about Banks. So he, and but what he did do is he got people excited about botany. He was the first person, if you like, to bring back news of the botanical wonders of the country. And he also got a bug for collecting and, and inspired, I think, lots of other people to take trips. And I'm going to return just briefly here to uh, Samuel Johnson again. And I just want to show you a little comparison. So the uh, Cook, as, as you all know, did two, uh, two more trips to the Pacific. Uh, he was planning his second trip. And Samuel Johnson was asked, uh, <laughs> would he like to go on Cook's second voyage to the Pacific? And it, it was uh, reported this way. A gentleman having come in who was to go as a mate on the ship along with Banks and Salander, Boswell said, have you not some desire to go upon this expedition, sir, to Johnson? Now Boswell, most of you may know, is the biographer of Johnson, wrote extensively about uh, a two volume work about Johnson. Why, yes, said Johnson, but I, I soon laid it aside. Sir, there is very little of intellectual in the course. So I don't think you'll find much of interest if he did that. Besides, I see but at a small distance. He had very, very poor eyesight. So it was not worth my while to go to see birds fly, which I have not seen, which I should not see fly, and fishes swim, which I should not see swim. So he felt he would not be the ideal person to go on a voyage to make observations because he wouldn't make them. So he not only thought he wouldn't find anything much of intellectual value, but he probably wouldn't see much anyway. Now, I just want to compare that with uh, Joseph Banks, who also excused himself from the second voyage to the South Pacific. Now, this was, uh, Banks was more likely to go on, I have to say. Samuel Johnson was never really likely to go. Um, uh, May 1772, Banks swore and stamped upon the wharf like a madman and instantly ordered his servants and all his things out of the ship. Now, what was happening was the ship was being decked out exactly as he had asked it to be, with lots of rooms, lots of space, uh, to create a, a, a scientific laboratory on the ship for the second voyage that would make his voyage much more success, successful from his point of view. Now, when they added all that to the ship, it turned out the ship would be not seaworthy and would essentially not be able to get down to the uh, Pacific at all. And so they decided to dismantle it all, hence his swearing and stamping on the wharf. So he did not choose to go on the voyage unless, and this is how he was described at the time, unless he could ride the waves triumphantly in all the pomp and splendour of an Eastern monarch. And uh, if you read uh, later references to this event, you see writers using terms like big-headed bot botanist, absurdly swollen head, juvenile, self-important, 
these are all descriptions of Joseph Banks. So while we do revere him and, uh, you know, he's an incredible person in terms of a, a guiding, if you like, and starting botanical discovery, supporting trips, uh, supporting funding trips, going on the trip to Australia, helping Kew Gardens, uh, really a catalyst for a lot of botanical work. Uh, he may not have been the, the nicest person at times and, and a little bit perhaps full of himself is what you might say in Australia. And here he is as the Eastern monarch, <laughs> uh, the Bath butterfly. And uh, so for, for Joseph, after his trip, just to continue where I started before, Joseph Banks uh, did go to Iceland in 1772. He got married, he lived in Soho, he had an estate, uh, he got a baronet. He was advised to King George III on Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria. As I mentioned before, he didn't actually work there, but he advised the king. And he encouraged and funded scientific voyages and scientists. So he was incredibly enthusiastic about exploration and travel. And he did support that when he could, while he had the money until later in, uh, later in his life. And he was invested as Knight of the Order of the Bath uh, in 1795. So that's, that's Joseph Banks. If I look now broadly at the legacy of his trip, and the, I've already talked a little bit about the botanical legacy in terms of the specimens, uh, there was a botanical infrastructure set up. So 18th century botanists in Britain or England were actually quite isolated from networks uh, in, in mainland Europe, which was much more active at the time. And I've mentioned here Swedish, German, French speaking botanists were very, very active and well networked. The British botanists weren't so much. There are a couple of chairs in botany at British universities, and I pointed out that um, Banks found it hard to get a botany lecturer at Oxford. Um, but it was comparatively weak medical training, botanical training, and had been described, I've seen it described as enlightened gardeners rather than botanists at the time. So what Banks did is raise that standard and interest in botany, certainly. The collection I've already mentioned distributed treasure, really, that historical botanical treasure and it set the foundation for the documentation of Australia's and New Zealand's flora in a scientific sense. And if you look at this rather complex diagram and we think about the legacy of banks, this is the, uh, the, the biodiversity of Australia and New Zealand divided up in a pie chart here and really summarising what we know and what we don't know. So the dark black areas in the middle are what we know and the coloured areas what we don't know. So if you look at the top right, for example, with insects, most of the insects we don't know. So we haven't named them, we don't know what they are, we haven't described them and we know a small proportion. Um, with the flowering plants, we do know more of the flowering plants. And if you can track down to the vascular plants, the bottom left there, so you can see various odd names there of algae and chromistera are kind of algae as well, and some bacteria are algal-like. But the vascular plants are the flowering plants and ferns. You can see, you know, it looks like we've got about 90, 90 95% of those. And it's true, we, we do know a fair chunk of the flora today, but still describing it. But that, that, uh, that knowledge of the flora scientifically at the time of Australia was right down as a dot in the middle of that diagram. And that whole chunk of the pie diagram really was uh, initiated by that trip of Banks to Australia. The First Fleet plants, of course, did go back to, the, to England. And I, I talked about the economic value of these trips, the food, the fibre, the medicine for the British colony, also coming the other way. So there were um, the, the material brought to Australia in the Botanic Garden in Sydney, for example, when that was eventually set up in 1816. That, that served as a place to send material back to the England. I keep going to say the UK, I don't know. The, back to England, but also bringing material from England uh, to Australia to be used in the, in the new uh, colony there uh, to support that growth of that colony. And quite famously, uh, of course, the people living there around the harbour didn't take advantage of the local knowledge and local plants and brought all their plants in and suffered for many years because they couldn't grow the plants they were used to growing in England. Surprise, surprise. Um, and then to come, uh, in terms of legacy, and I mentioned this right at the very start, um, in Australia at least, I, we, we have not really reconciled the knowledge of Australia's first people with that Western science, so benefiting our understanding of the country's flora and its true history. So while we have that that in-depth knowledge now of the flora to a certain degree, there's a lot to be found out about it. 
we still haven't made that connection, that direct, uh, reconciliation in a sense, if I can use that word, between the knowledge of First Peoples and the knowledge that's been gained through science. So we do have work to do, and you've seen this picture before in that lovely poem we saw at the start from Auntie Irene. And the, this is from Bruce Pascoe's book, Dark Emu, and talking about agriculture in Australia. And I mentioned banks looking out and not seeing uh, cultivation, not seeing agriculture, because he wouldn't recognise what uh, agriculture would look like in a country like Australia. He wouldn't recognise how the plants were being used. He, he was looking for them having breakfast at 10 a.m. in the morning. That's the kind of uh, approach as a 25-year-old to the country that he was taking. So we still have not only that knowledge to share, if you like, uh, that we know about the, the country's flora, but I, th I think to integrate that with the scientific knowledge we have. And I'm finishing up here just with a, a picture of a cabinet. So I, I called the talk uh, Sir Joseph Banks Cabinet, and this is Sir Joseph Banks Cabinet. This is the director's office at Royal Botanic Gardens, Sydney. It's a picture taken in 2007 when I was the director there. You can see inside one of the shelves there are Banksia, Banksia serrata from Botany Bay. This um, was a specimen I would always show people visiting the office or if we had a, a government minister would come visiting or a donor or a, a small child interested in botany who just wanted to get a sense of what it was like to be a director of botanic gardens. You can see here the how powerful it would be to see this plant specimen, one of the first collected scientifically and taken back to, to England. And uh, and it's it's inside what's called Sir Joseph Banks Cabinet. And this particular cabinet was from Joseph Banks' offices. So he had a number of these cabinets. It's called the Red Cedar Cabinet. And in fact, it appeared in a, a display uh, of red cedar in Australia, as you can see here, an exhibition held at the Museum of Sydney in 2004. And it was built for Joseph Banks in about 1800, we think, donated to the Botanic Gardens by the British Museum of Natural History, and it's lived inside the director's office at the gardens. Just as a little aside, because I always think these things are quite amusing, it turns out it's not red cedar, actually. It's, so it was in the Red Cedar in Australia exhibition, and it's most likely mahogany. They did some microscopic study of the wood grain at uh, only, only in the last decade or so, and discovered that, in fact, the wood inside that, and when it was being sold here in auction, that's when they did the study so that they could show it was made of red cedar. It turned out it wasn't made of mahogany. It was made of mahogany. And uh, Joseph Maiden, the director of the time, uh, got it wrong when he thought it was red cedar. Nevertheless, beautiful cabinet, uh, lovely wood, came from Banks' office, got to Sydney, holds a, a collection of the Banks here, and it, it's just a fantastic legacy. So for me, uh, if we look back on that time, and it's, you know, there's all kinds of mixed emotions we have about that trip. Uh, from a botanical sense, that start of that, uh, that scientific investigation of the flora they're starting to get a sense of the breadth and depth of the flora. And also that interestingly, I think as a botanist, how it compares with the rest of the world's flora, because it's that's what's really interesting is where that Banksia sits. I talked about the Linnaean system, where the Banksia sits in its family, Proteaceae, that we now know grows in South America. We now know the connections between those two floras. We now know they're all once part of Gondwana. We now so some of those plants have been split apart and ended up on parts of their continent. We know others have traveled across the sea. So the very start of those, that, that discussion, the start of that knowledge, the start of just getting excited about our amazing flora that we love to, to grow, to enjoy in Australia and use, really uh, dates back for, for the English and Europeans to that time. So I think for, for us, we can look, and this is my, my final slide here, we can Read the diaries of Banks, and these, I really do recommend you look these up. This is in the State Library in New South Wales, beautifully presented. You can read the, the words of Banks. You have to read it as a 25-year-old Englishman coming to Australia, seeing things like he would on the moon, not quite knowing how to interpret them, uh, making many mistakes, and, uh, and also that sort of mixed emotion we have about that voyage in the first place, but botanically, uh, and the fact that they called it Botany Bay, the, the fact that they saw that area and they saw the Australian flora as, as what was the most, uh, I suppose, exciting and memorable part of that first touching down in Australia for 
Banks, Joseph Banks and his team. Thank you. I'd particularly like to thank Alex Smart and Dallas Bolton for all their work. Um, and it's been very hard during COVID-19. Uh, they have persevered and done a fantastic job in producing the twin exhibitions. I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Pina Mill uh, of the Melbourne Herbarium. Without her, we wouldn't be able to have exhibited the original uh, collections made by Banks and Solander. That was wonderful. Uh, and thank you too to Michael Cook for your great video work and uh, the studio and help put this together. I hope you find the presentations today very interesting and enlightening. Thank you.